Hey, good afternoon, church. Um, you may be seated. Today we're going to continue on in our, ex I'm, I'm excited, y'all. So we're going to be continuing on in our Community Maker series. Uh, as we are, as you guys know now, we are rolling out three new community groups. And so this is kind of our preparation as about what it means to be a community together, what it means to be God's family on God's mission together. And so um, I'm excited to continue. Today we have uh, a special guest, uh, my brother in Christ, a fellow minister of the gospel, uh, Pastor Marcus Wilson. Uh, he is one of the church planting residents uh, at the village, being sent, commissioned, like I, I was, but he's going to be planting in the Waxahachie area. So excited to, to hear the, the word that he has prepared for us. Thank you for coming, brother, and also thank you to uh, his daughter, Lee, for coming as well. It looks like y'all already made friends and connected, so that's good to see. <laughs> All right? Uh, but I, I have the passage of scripture here to read for us as we begin, and it's coming from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, starting in verse 1. And I'll read this for us, and then I'm going to ask Pastor Marcus to come, okay? I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. This is God's word. Good afternoon, Icon. Thank y'all so much for having me. My wife, um, she wants me to make sure I tell you guys, hey, she's going to miss you today. And uh, she sends her love. She has to be at home. She's an adjunct at Chriswell College, so she's getting some stuff together for her student. And it is such a joy, um, Pastor David, to be in front of your beautiful congregation to present um, God's word to everybody. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, as Pastor David read from Ephesians chapter 4, 1 through 6, this is David giving an exhortation to the people. And David, he's on his third mission trip, journey, and he's in prison. He's in prison, and as he's in prison, he's writing, and he's sending these letters off. And this letter right here means so much to him. So he's in Rome, in prison, or Caesarea, and um, he's, he's, he's feeling this love for the people of Ephesians. But before he sent this letter off, he was already appreciating the elders of Ephesians, and he was telling the elders, hey, look, y'all did a great job. Y'all was successful at protecting us from false teachers. Thank you. However, however, uh, we have another situation that has occurred. We have a problem now. And here's the problem. Uh, we have forgotten about the brilliancy of our first love, Jesus Christ. So this is Paul giving this exhortation to the ones in Ephesians. And he's kind of he's kind of worried, but he's cool, but he's all right. But yet and still, he's Giving this concern. When I was nine years old, my parents, full-time missionary, of course the money was low. But let me just go and throw that out there, being a full-time missionary. And I was in a living room and my, my mom, she was in the kitchen cooking. So she had put together some baked chicken with some broccoli, with some carrots, with some onions, and she stuffed it into his bag. And when she put it in this bag, this bag makes it, makes the meat so tender, along with adding water, and it brings it to its own broth as well, mixed with the chicken. So I'm in the living room, nine years old, couldn't wait to eat because it was smelling so good. Then all of a sudden, I hear this loud noise. Slam! I got up. I know I scared you, didn't I? I'm so sorry, baby. I'm sorry. I got up. I looked in the kitchen. And there was this 
stove, the stove door slammed to the ground that made the loud noise. The hinges on the side of both doors were broken. So me, my mom and I, we tried our best to pull that stove door up and close it, but yet it kept falling back down. The hinges broke on it. So we decided to find a stick to prop it up, make sure it was closed tight so the food can keep cooking. The stick started edging back a little bit. And it kept the door from closing all the way, and the food couldn't cook properly. So we just thought, hey, why don't we just get some duct tape? And we got some duct tape, some good old duct tape. Duct tape holds everything. We put the duct tape on the door. We, we got pretty good, what, four different long straps of that duct tape. Smashed the duct tape down on the door. Brought the tape all the way down to the cabinet. So there's this piece of tape on the cabinet and the stove holding the door closed to the oven on both sides. So there's two and two. And back in the day, y'all, duct tape, whenever something was broken, we didn't have super glue. It was either duct tape or nail. <laughs> so we got the duct tape. That worked for about a good week. Uh, we did get a price on how much it cost to get the hinges fixed. End up, we had to get the new stove, but we didn't have money to get the new stove, so we just had to ride with the duct tape. Again, that lasted for about a week. But in between the week that it lasted, we were able to have some food that was cooked properly. Here, here's the problem. The problem happened when the wear and tear of the heat Start making a duct tape not stick. And so as it stops sticking like it's supposed to stick, it start loosening its grip. It start losing the grip. And we were back to square one. Slam the stove right back on the ground. We tried it again, but the wear and tear took the adhesive bond and it just turned into some gooey type substance and it wasn't able to stick to the stove. What I want to share with us today, there's this Christ's love that will never loosen. It will never lose its grip. It'll always stick to us and it never fades away like the duct tape stove. Christ's love, Christ's love is what I love about his love. Even through difficult storms, even through life storms, sometimes our love with our kids, it kind of loosens up. We stop being intimate, but we there for them. Sometimes the love with our spouse through, during a life crisis or a life challenging moment, the love kind of just loosen up through some type of marriage storm. Even work environment. Work about the duty, the love for the job, it kind of started loosening away because of what we're going through at work. But what I love about Jesus Christ's love, it never loosens. It always keeps its grip. Even when we are not in step with the spirit of love that brings unity. The title of this message, I'm going to need my glasses, y'all, because you know a brother can't see that good. The title of this message is Love in Unity, Strive in Oneness. Love in Unity, Walk in Oneness. There are two points I would like to make today. The first point, strive in love with your calling. That'll be verses 1 and 2. The second one will be taken from verses 3 through 6. The second point I want to make to us today is strive in unity with love. Strive in unity 
with love. The first point, strive in love with your calling. In verse 1, Paul he gives this exhortation. He gives this encouragement. He says, I urge you, walk, uh, live worthy of your calling. Paul is saying, with your calling, with your vocation, whatever that is, in your personal life, in your church life, live worthy of your calling. Paul is saying, hey, there's a balance here. There's a balance on how you as believers, how we as believers in our personal life, we should conduct ourselves. Uh, there's some responsibility that we have as believers that we need to take on and walk that out in our vocation, in your job, at your job, at church, whatever position you serve. Paul is saying, walk worthy of it. A balance. What does it look like if I was to come up, yes, give the gospel, live it well in front of you, but in my personal life, I'm living in secret, far from the gospel. Paul is telling us we have a calling in our vocation as a father, as a mother, your position at work, position at home, who we are as believers. Live worthy balance. Have a balanced life. And Paul is encouraging all of us to live this way. As Christians, our conduct, our behavior, as humans, are as believers, it should be worthy of balance, where people can tell, oh, they are a believer. They represent well. They 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 show the love that Christ share and shows every time. What happens when this doesn't happen? In verse 2, Paul, he brings up three virtues. And here are the three. The three are be completely humble, be completely gentle, and be patient. Those three things, I ain't going to lie, y'all. Those three things are hard to do sometimes. Uh, be gentle. You ask me to be gentle when I don't want to be gentle because somebody done turned up. On a highway, here we go now. They want to try to get in my lane, bully me, honk the horn behind me, rushing, and you telling me to be gentle, humble, and patient. Mm -hmm. All right, Lord, I need you to erase some things in my mind because I have some words I want to throw at them. But the Lord said, be completely humble, be completely gentle, be completely patient. So you telling me I gotta be patient with this driver that's getting on my nerves, riding my bump. Be completely humble. Be completely gentle. Be completely patient. Y'all looking at me like I'm the only one deal with these drivers. Y'all deal with them too. <laughs> completely humble. Humble. Hmm. Humble. When I think about humble, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about humility. When I think about humility, I think about how Christ was humble all the way to the point of death. He obeyed the Father, being humbled, obedience. He could have had a moment like, I don't feel like time for them. Uh-uh, no. But he did. He had a moment to be obedient, practice humility, being humble, and went to the cross. But in being humble, he practiced meekness. He practiced being gentle, which is having this power under self-control. That's tough. Being gentle, I mean, you don't want to be gentle. Because, you know, some people, they just need some roughness added to them. But we have to be completely Gentle. Completely gentle. When I was in high school, 
I had classwork, y'all. I did my classwork. My parents said, uh, Marcus, you finished with your homework? I'm like, yeah, I finished my homework. But at the same time, I was in a rush to go outside to play with the rest of the fellas. They asked me a question, did I finish my homework? To me, I finished my homework. But this is what I did, y'all. This is between us, okay? This is between us. <laughs> Problems 1 through 10, I didn't do all of them. I only did 1 through 6, 1 through 7. To me, I'm finished because I want to hurry up and go outside. But the next day when it was time to turn that work in, at least about three questions or four questions I didn't do, which I didn't care. I just turned my work in. So when the paper was given back to us, guess what was on my paper? It wasn't an F. It was an I, which stands for incomplete. Paul is saying be completely humble, be completely gentle, be completely patient, there's no room for an I to be incomplete. There's no room for an I to be incomplete. Meaning, I have to work extra hard, stay longer in the house to finish my work. Paul is saying, it's work to be gentle. It's work to be humble. It, it's work to be patient. As a PE teacher, he reminded me, this is one of my former students, y'all. PE teaching as the athletic director, I had to be completely patient with these guys learning some plays. I'm teaching the plays over and over and over again. I had to be completely patient. I had to teach. I had to spend longer hours training, showing them what they're missing in a play. All right, I had to be patient. Yes, I could have been that coach that threw a clipboard. I could have been that coach that Cussed them out. I could have been that coach that walked away, but here's, here's what I love about this. My love for them was attached to me being patient with them and walking with them because I wanted them to perfect the play. Jesus Christ is the same way. He walks with us. I want to make sure we get what it means to be patient. We get what it means to love. We get what it means to be gentle. We get what it means to be humble. That's Christ. Walk into being gentle, being humble, being patient. And here's, here's the tricky part about being patient. A patient is a spirit that never gives up. It endures till the end, even times of adversity. You got that relative that just so tired of having patience with? Not here, but do you have that church member you just tired of being patient with? They keep going through the same thing over and over. You just tired. Patient is attached to love. Be completely patient. Let our love be weather resistance through any life storm. And if you're not in one now, you're probably getting out of one or getting into one or rejoicing and having victory you may be in a storm but be completely patient in the storm and endure christ's love is going to help you be complete in it not incomplete when i go back and i ask the holy spirit holy spirit show me what i was incomplete in because i know i'm gonna have to have a do-over but show me what i was incomplete in being gentle with my kids show me that so i can ask for forgiveness well here's a review you asked for it here's the report boom get the report i gotta go to them and confess uh, that is hard for not being gentle 
to my co-worker, I apologize for not being gentle. Why is this so important? 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 through 8, it talks about what love is. Y'all know what it is. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not rude. It does not insist of own way. It is not irritable. It is not resentful. It does not rejoice at any wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. David highlights some fruit of the spirits taken from Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Fruit of the spirit. Stay in step. Later down in Galatians chapter 5, it says, stay in step with the Spirit. When we stay in step with the Spirit, it's hard for the flesh to take over and do what the flesh wants it to do. Paul is saying, stay in step with the Spirit. This is love. This is love. As I mentioned once before, with the basketball team that I used to coach, on how I had to be patient, gentle, be humble, how I had to practice some fruit of the spirits. I also had to say to myself, this matters because this brings unity. So if I was to take my time and have patience and teach my basketball team, the plays we're trying to run. The calling you have on the team. You're a point guard. You're not a center. I don't need you as a point guard going in with the big man trying to get every single rebound. That's not you. You're on a 5 2. They 7. <laughs> they 6 10. No. You on a point. Uh, power forward. Well, yeah, today we do have power fours and centers. These are positions that basketball players play. Uh, I don't need you to be shooting threes. I need you to bang in a plane. I need you to go up. I need you to get some rebounds. I need you to stick with your calling. So when these guys, bro, I'm, when these guys uh, start sticking with their calling and they start gelling and they were in their lane, in their attitude, because we had to work on some attitudes. There were some guys I had to break in because their attitudes were rough, their behavior was rough. But when all of it starts sinking in and they start working as a unit and start looking like a fine well machine, they was looking like one in sync with one another. So their attitudes were in place. Their behavior was in place. So if you have something that's opposite of the fruit of the spirit and they boasting on themselves, they think they the man, that's not going to work on the team. So some attitudes and behaviors had to be changed. And that was done. And all of a sudden, we start seeing this basketball team, when they look at each other, that was a play. I didn't have to voice out, run three, skin back. I didn't have to run. They had this connection, this vibe, and so they was reading one another, and they knew exactly what to do to make some stuff happen. They were just clicking. That is so key, walking in love and unity. You get to click. You can feel what each other is feeling. You know how to serve each other well because you can feel when someone is hurting. You know how to build up in a gentle response, not a rough one. You just start clicking. That's the beauty of unity. And that's what the basketball team that I coach had. We were just clicking in all areas. And before you know it, they start striving. Striving. Striving in unity with love. Point number two. 
when this is done, when this is done, you can see each person making every effort to walk in unity. Making every effort to keep the unity. In verse 3, Paul says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Who's the bond of peace? Christ is the bond of peace. Make every effort not to be like the duct tape on the stove, <laughs> but make every effort to keep the unity, keep a grip on the love of peace. Who is Christ? Who is love? And it can be messy, y'all. It can be real messy trying to keep peace. Not a passive peace, but a spirit of truth type peace. Like correcting when you really don't feel like correcting, but you love that person so much. And you want the best for them, and you want to correct them in a gentle way. And you want to come to them in a humble way. And you want to be patient and sit and correct them with truth. Sometimes that is so hard, but yet can be messy. Because the messy part of that, that when we correct each other because we want to keep in step with the spirit, we want to keep the unity, we want to stay attached to love, the message part of that is the backlash of correcting. And it just kind of be messy when we correct, even when it's in love, within that, Somebody would throw up all on you with some words that you didn't even know they had in their vocabulary. <laughs> because they were always stepping in the spirit. Sometimes it just takes that one conversation or that button to push to see what's really in us. And that's the part Christ want to work the most. You want to work in, in all parts, yes. But that button that's pushed, like I can easily ignore somebody real good. But I can I can have some false humility in it and ignore you real good because of something you said I didn't like and I'm going to go about my business, but I'm going to act like, hey, how you doing? <laughs> but y'all know how we do. Make every effort to keep the unity even when it hurts. In verse 4, Paul, he goes in and he says, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One body, one spirit, one Paul, he's getting ready to, he just named three. He's getting ready to go into seven elements. Seven elements. He mentioned one body, one spirit, and one hope. He mentioned these three. These are the three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Trinity works in unity. Paul, he's going to go into seven elements that is so key. That is so important. But let's just talk about the body. There are three manifestations that happen. The first manifestation. This is when Christ, when he died for us and he was put into the ground, but yet he burst out of the ground in three days. That's God showing his power in Christ. That's the first manifestation. The second manifestation is when, is when Christ, he put all things at his feet. Lord, authority, all things up under his feet. The third manifestation was when Christ hid over the church. Head over to, this is so key, this is so important, because we get to see 
we get to see the three persons in one just working all together as one. And I'm going to bring that up down later in the sermon. I have this so important. One body. One body. There are believers who we don't see who are visible that we don't even know that they, they are believers. And so the one body is universal. Universal church. There are many believers everywhere that we don't see. But they are part of the body, the universal body. All believers are part of this universal body. There is one spirit. There is one spirit. It's the same Holy Spirit that dwells in each of us, that dwells in you, that dwells in me, that dwells in you, Pastor Dave, that dwells in in everybody. And this Holy Spirit dwells in the church as well. The universal church. Ephesians, taken from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 22. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has a job, y'all. And it's a permanent job. The Holy Spirit has a permanent ministry. Has a permanent ministry. You know how sometimes we get tired of ministry because it's just it's too cray cray. It's, it's just too crazy. It's just too much. The people just off the chain, man. They just got too many problems and they put their burdens on ours. We already got some burdens. Like, oh, I'm just tired of ministry. I'm just going to check out. Or I'm just going to, you know, have a position and just go with the flow. I'm not really going to do ministry that much. It's just too dirty. Too dirty. But I like being seen. I like meeting people because I like using people my own agenda. I'm going to call. Um, Let's see, who's in my group? I'm going to call them and see if uh, they would like to come over. And then when they come over, I'm going to fix them a little snack. And then I'm going to ask them, can they watch the kids? Because I got my own personal agenda. I ain't going to let them know that. But anyway, <laughs> so the Holy Spirit has a permanent ministry that never stops in us. The Holy Spirit has a permanent ministry that never stops Bringing us together as one, bringing us together in unity, bringing us together to show love. It never stops. Could you imagine if the Holy Spirit ministry stopped? I don't even think I get a notification, Pastor David. I don't even think I get some type of bell or alert that says from the Holy Spirit, you wasn't gentle. I need you to rewind, backtrack, and see how you wasn't gentle. You, you was very arrogant when you was talking to your brothers, boasting. Can you imagine if we didn't get those notifications by the whisper of the Holy Spirit talking to us? <clears throat> the Spirit is so loving and tell us the truth. I am so glad that the Spirit tells us. One in spirit, one in hope, just as you are called, one in hope. When you are called, this hope, this hope is for the future. This hope happens when we become believers and there's this hope. It's not a wishful type hope. It's this hope that we know Christ is going to do what he's going to do. We believe in the Bible. We have hope in this word. That's that type of hope. We have hope. And all believers have this hope. And all believers have this common hope. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 15 talks about this hope. This hope gives us, y'all, confidence of knowing that Christ is doing the work because of the call of salvation. See Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Chapter 2, verse 7. Love this hope that give us confidence. You know what else I love about the Holy Spirit, y'all? 
is that when we step in oneness, we can meet each other confirmation in something. Uh, have you just met someone else confirmation that the Spirit has confirmed you about? And it just meets. Like David and I, we can have a conversation on the phone. And then I can tell David, hey David, I was thinking about, I was thinking about this dude, man, that we know. And his name is Derek. And Pastor David said, Bro, I was too. I said, bro. I would say, bro. Man, we need to pray for this dude. This dude is just going through like tons of stuff. They would be like, yeah, I got that feeling too. Let's pray for him. Confirmation meeting. Then later, uh, we, either David or myself, we'll bump into uh, the person I just told you. And that person would say, man, I was going through a rough time. Dude, the Holy Spirit gave us confirmation to pray for this dude. And we were right on time. The Holy Spirit works together. We buzz and sustain Christ in one. As to pray for who needs that moment of prayer. Love the Holy Spirit on the work the Holy Spirit is, does. Love that work and what the Holy Spirit does. The true body of Christ. One body. The true body of Christ. In John chapter 2, verse 13 through 25, um, the pilgrims who was coming into Jerusalem who were with a group of uh, Jewish people and the Pharisees. Uh, Jesus, this is when he turned water into wine, but yet they were having this Passover, but yet, you know, they kind of tested him a little bit. And uh, Jesus had to, you know, flip some tables over. And uh, they said to him after he made this remark, he said, oh, y'all worried about that temple? I get rid of that temple and I have a new temple in three days and they were like wait how you gonna get rid of this temple and it took us 46 years to build this temple oh i have a new temple in three days they were looking for a sign and looking for proof looking for a miracle, but, but they missed the whole thing and jesus was saying the temple i raised you will come to me to meet my father no one comes to the father but through me the body the believers will come they will be with me. They will be with my body. The body, one body. All of us, because of Jesus Christ's love, meets the Father in his true temple. One body. Who makes us here at this church, you are one body at Icon. And each of you have a specific calling. That will contribute to this body. Paul later in Ephesians, he goes down and he talks about the gifts. He also talks about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, and also in Romans 2. He talks about the gifts on how, so, how that is so important to be activated in a body. And so what I want to tell you is that in our calling, in the body, that the third day he rose, he bust out of the ground, he welcomed us to it, believers to it. In that body, let's function with love, function in unity, and function in oneness, in the true body. And closing in um, verse 5 and 6, some more stuff that David talks about concerning the seven, the seven elements. He says there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. This is a reminder for all of us, y'all. This is referring to God being in all things. 
believers get the experience what God is in. God, who is the Father, He is showing us through all things. Uh, verses uh, 5 through 6. Since He's in all, He's calling us all into that relationship that He has made available to us. He is in all. And in all, it's just Him. He's the only one. Oneness. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of all. The Trinity has its distinctive roles. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but yet in all, in oneness, in unity, that's distributing love to all of us, that the Trinity has welcomed in us to be in fellowship with that, to walk in unity with everybody else in the body. That is, that is, man, that's amazing. That is amazing. If you don't take anything with you today, please take this with you. Strive in love with your calling. Strive in unity with love. Be the glue of love that holds things together at Icon. Don't be the duct tape to the stove that I talked about that will loosen its grip, that will lose the adhesive to the tape that will pop away from the cabinet, that will pop away from the stove, and the stove slam, door slam down. Don't lose the glue of love so we can stay together and bond with each other. That is Christ. He made that available for all of us. Walk in love, walk in unity. Make every effort to keep the peace icon. Make every effort, because Christ did it for all of us. Lord, thank you so much for speaking to us, God, and keeping the unity. Also, showing the glue of love because you did it for us. There will be some moments that we will be tested in the storm of life. But you are the one that holds all things together in the storm. God, your love is so amazing. And you want others to witness that type of love you have given us. So let us be careful of not wanting to show that love in our calling in our personal life. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. Because somebody is looking on how we are being led. Somebody is looking on how we are walking our life in our calling, in our vocation, because they want to be just like us. But we are showing who Christ is. God, be with us all. And that we can express love even when it's messy. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Marcus. <clears throat> hey, church, we're about to say communion together. And so if you don't have an element, uh, the elements, please, uh, there's going to be Jacob walking around helping you get one. But, um, I just want to say this as a re response to what you shared, brother, was here's what I think this is true. God will never bless a divided church. God will never bless a divided church. And I think throughout history and even if you look at all across America and the world today, we see a lot of divided churches. But the church 
that the Spirit of God chooses to empower are those who walk in a manner worthy of Christ, who love one another ferociously, who are united in the Spirit because their allegiance is not first and foremost to their ethnicity, to their culture, to their political agenda, to whatever else you can, you can name. Their allegiance, church, icon church, our allegiance, the flag that we wave is the gospel. It's the triune God. It's King Jesus. That's who we seek to serve. Church, we truly are one family. It's not a symbolic, metaphorical thing. We truly are. Look across this room right now. Doesn't matter what skin color. Doesn't matter what age. Doesn't matter what background or marital status. We truly are one. And if we want to be a church that the Lord blesses and uses, we can't hesitate. We can't question our unity in Christ. We have to live it. And how do we know that we're united? Every single week we take the elements together. We are reminded of our union. 1 Corinthians 11 pull up the passage on the screen for us. This is what the Apostle Paul tells us. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Church, let us take the body of Christ together as one. And Paul continues. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Church, the blood of Christ is spilled for us. Let us take it together as one. Let's continue with worship.